Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk on pattern matching. I'm really glad that you've chosen this session today to attend. So we'll have, we'll have lots of exciting stuff for you, and we'll go through them uh, in a moment. First, let, uh, let us tell a bit about ourselves. My name is Hanno, and I work as an IT consultant uh, based in the Netherlands. Um, my employer is called InfoSupport. Uh, we do all kinds of stuff with, uh, with Java. Um, besides my consultancy work, I also am a community lead, so uh, I run a Java community within uh, the company InfoSupport, and within that community we really try to research the latest stuff that, that we can find about Java. And um, is, it is through this Java community that we also got involved with pattern matching. Uh, besides work, I like to play the guitar, and I like public speaking, and when I can, I do them at the same time, like in the picture. This was in DevOx uh, Antwerp. I didn't get my guitar through the customs this time, so sorry about that. It will just have to be the speaking for now. And I'm together here with Peter, my colleague. Yes, I'm Peter Wessels. I also work at InfoSupport as an IT consultant. I'm a Java entu enthusiastic, and um, I really like domain-driven design, so we're up for domain-driven design. Uh, look me up, then we have a talk. Uh, but before we dive into pattern matching, let's raise some hands. So. Who of you is running Java 7 or below in production? <laughs> so are there people? Uh -huh. Yeah, always one. We feel for you. <laughs> Great. So welcome, everybody. Um, Java 8 in production. And look, that's great. So Java <laughs> 11? Great. And we always try Java 17? Oh, good great. for you. Great, Good so we you. have some <laughs> very nice features you can play with today if you are on Java 17, if you are below Java 17, we have some, some exciting st stuff that comes up. And we, before further ado, let's dive into it. Yes, great. So notice that I also had my, my hand up at Java 8. That's not because I did, don't have any experience with Java 17, of course I do, but yeah, I'm in consultancy, so, so sometimes you get placed at a client project, and the project I'm doing right now is stuck at Java 8, but I see these things as a challenge, you know? Try to get them on board with your Java versions, and uh, I'll try to, uh, enthusiast to, to try to get them enthusiastic about pattern matching. So there's, there's still hope for everyone who is stuck with Java 8. But I, I think, well, I have hope for you, so also for myself. <laughs> um, so the first time we encountered pattern matching uh, was in Java 14 with pattern matching for instance of. And um, the question I immediately had when, when seeing this is, well, is it a small enhancement, just a tiny, a tiny trick that makes your life as a Java developer a bit easier, or does it actually uh, involve a lot more than that? So is it a major feature? Well, I'm not sure at this point, and at the end of the talk, we will try to draw conclusions based on these two extremes, so should we consider it a small announcement or a major feature? And I will try to answer the, we will try to answer this question um, together with you. Um, so let's start out with pattern matching for instance of. And because uh, a lot of you folks uh, raised their hands with versions below Java 17, I'm going to start at, at, the, at the beginning with pattern matching for instance of. Now, I always like to uh, demo a feature using a relatable uh, code domain. And because I am a musician, I like to, uh, to use music as, a, as an example. I realize this is a bit small, so I'll try to zoom, to zoom in a bit for you. So um, being a musician, I really hated the fact that during uh, the pandemic, the physical music stores were closed, right? And I really, liked, I, I really liked to visit music stores and check out the different guitars and spend way too much money and get home with another, another guitar and upset my wife with it. So um, during, um, during COVID times, the only thing that I had that resembled physical music stores is using it in, as code examples, which is what we are going to do today, you know, as a bit of therapy for all the lost time in physical music stores, at least for me. So let's introduce a music store example. Uh, we will post a link at the final slide um, to GitHub, if you're interested in the example code, you can look it up for yourself. Um, let's start out very simple. The only thing we're selling right now is guitars. That's it, nothing else. 
and uh, our example guitar only stores a name for now, nothing else. We will expand upon this example uh, in a few minutes, but this is all we have right now. Okay, so pre-Java 14, if we would get a generic product from a database and we wouldn't know for sure whether it's actually an instance of a guitar, we would do an instance of NCAST. Um, I assume this is familiar to you already. So um, if we want to use this, um, we use this instance of check. Is the product an instance of the guitar? Well, if it is, then we have to cast it to a guitar, even though we already know that it's an instance of it, right? This, this mechanism always felt a bit clunky to me. Because actually we are doing three things at the same time. We are wondering, is product at runtime a guitar? Well, if it is, we have to perform a conversion by casting it. And then thirdly, we have to declare a variable and bind its value. In this case, it's probably a less pool, so bind the value to the variable less pool. And then, finally, we can use less pool. Now, there are quite a few drawbacks here because it's quite verbose. Also, I don't understand why we both need the type test and the cost. Surely, when, when we get inside this if block, we already know for sure that's a guitar, right, at runtime. And the actual logic, which is use less pole, this is the actual logic, I've commented it out for, for now, but that's the bit that's the most important in the end. I don't, I don't care about all this ceremony here at the top. I don't care about that at all. So um, I would like my attention to be drawn to the actual logic. And also we see that we have repeated um, the guitar type three times here. Instance of guitar, guitar less pole, cause to do a guitar. Makes it maybe a bit more difficult to maintain. Of course, our IDEs can do refactorings, but I like to state this type only once instead of multiple times. So if we could compress these three steps here into a single one, the situation would improve dramatically. And this is actually what pattern matching for instance of does. So uh, if product instance of guitar less pole, guitar less pole is actually the type pattern here. And it does three things at the same time. It does uh, testing, it does conditional extraction, and it does binding to a variable, in this case, less pole. And if this um, if this expression uh, uh, resolves to true, then we can use less pole. And um, we have really improved upon the drawbacks that I mentioned before. And our attention immediately goes to the actual logic instead of the ceremony. So we've seen that a type pattern consists of a predicate that specifies a type along with a single binding variable. In our example, this was less pole. And it looks a bit like a variable declaration, which is not an accident because it was made to look like a variable declaration. And um, this is actually the first feature in Java that uses the gener generic pattern matching con um, concept because it allows the conditional extraction of components from objects to be expressed more concisely and safely. Now, in, in general, it's not a new concept because a lot of programming languages already support pattern matching. So languages such as Haskell, C Sharp, Erlang, and maybe more familiar to us folks, uh, Scala also supports it. What kind of things can we do with pattern matching for instance of? Well, to provide you with a simple example, let's simplify an implementation of equals. We all write equals methods, I guess, um, or maybe we let the, the IDE generate them for us, I can imagine. So let's get to our IDEs here. So this is the equals method of the class guitar, right? I, I told you it only has a name, well in the full example it has a bit more, but it's not rele relevant for now. Um, we um, keep track whether it's in tune, for example. But in the equals method, we just want to check the field's name and the guitar type right here. Well, pre-Java 14, this is a five-line method implementation. Uh, using pattern matching, for instance, we can reduce it to a single single line of code. So let's remove all this ceremony right here and just say uh, return um, O instance of guitar other and name equals other name and guitar type is other guitar. So the right hand side of this boolean expression will only be evalu evaluated if O actually is a guitar at runtime. And in this way you can reduce it to a single line. I really like that. So back to the slides then. Um, get into some details now. Um, we are doing declaring in the middle here. 
So less pull is an ordinary variable right here in the pattern match, but its declaration location is different, obviously. We are used to local variables being declared at the left margin, right? Or as part of a for loop. But patterns declare local variables in the middle of a statement or expression. So this may take a little time to get used to. Also, scoping is different. We are used to block scoping, right? So if you declare a local variable inside a method body, for example, you know that um, it is available to you in the entire method. Or if you declare a local variable in an if block, it will be available to you in the scope of the if block, but not outside of the if block. Well, a pattern binding variable is you don't, doesn't use block scoping, but flow scoping. And flow scoping is defined by the set of places where it would definitely, definitely be assigned. So I used to have a light over here, but yeah, there it is. So um, sometimes it's disappeared. I'm, I'm not sure why. Sorry about that. Um, so if product actually is a guitar, then it will evaluate the right hand side of the expression. But if it's not a guitar, say, say it is an amplifier, not a guitar, then it won't even get to here, right? So flow scoping is defined in this case by, um, if it is a guitar, then this, in this case it will be in scope. And also here, but in the else block it won't be in scope because in the else block we're sure that it's not a guitar. So the variable also isn't in scope here. So let's summarize the benefits of this mechanism. I don't think we will see many more costs. I can't imagine anything. Uh, other, uh, uh, maybe if you're using very old libraries or if you don't want to use generic types or something, but in this case, you don't need costs anymore. And it's obviously more concise. So it takes a little less time to write, it takes less time to read and to understand for your, your coworkers. So everyone is a bit happier. Um, Every time we encounter during the stock a pattern kind, because we will uh, address several of them, we will put this slide up so you can have a bit summary, a bit of a summary uh, on the pattern kind. So the first pattern kind is the type pattern, and it looks like like that. So can you use this already? Well, it depends on what Java version you're running, of course. But starting from Java 16, uh, this feature is in final status, so it won't change in any way. Um, of, of course, it will be developed, but it will be uh, backwards compatible with what it is right now, so it won't change drastically anymore. So starting from Java 16, you can use this in production. Moving on now, because it gets more interesting. Because you can, um, uh, pattern matching for switch is a new feature that extends the use of pattern matching, not only in instance objects or with type patterns, but also in switch statements. And for this, we need to extend our code example a bit. So, Besides selling guitars, we now also sell effect pedals that you can link up to your electric guitar to change the tone of your guitar, obviously. And we have um, defined an effect interface, and the only thing that it does is uh, it, it provides an apply method, and implementers can implement the apply method. And for now, we have, um, uh, we have created the delay class and a reverb class, which are two type, types of effect pedals, of course. And um, they each have their specific properties. So delay has a time in milliseconds, which corresponds to the delay time, and reverb has a room size. To connect this to the guitar, we introduce an amplifier. The amplifier has um, an effect loop attached to it, and an effect loop is effectively a list, or in this case, a set of effects that are applied in order. And finally, let's introduce a few more effect implementors so a tremolo, an overdrive, a tuner pedal, and uh, we have completed our example. So to uh, demonstrate pattern matching for switch, we are going to write a method that acts on a generic effect. So the interface right here. And we want to um, create some behavior that changes based on the runtime type, right? So we have an example right here that gets an effect and um, if it's a delay, for example, you want to uh, store a description that, um, that introduces the specific delay fields, in this case, times in milliseconds. And it goes on and on, right? 25 lines of code for something that's in essentially quite simple. So let's highlight the actual logic here. I've highlighted those lines right now. And they are just seven lines. Seven lines that are really the business logic. Um, 
the rest is all ceremony, so we really want to reduce this. Well, if we apply pattern matching for instance of, which we just learned about, of course, we can simplify the example like this. Let's make the business logic stand out again. So now we are down to 19 lines of code, but still it doesn't feel very elegant. I mean, we, we still have 12 lines of code that are dedicated to ceremony. And also I don't like these repetitions, else if, don't like it at all. Of course, a far better fit would be a switch statement here because we have so many options. Although the switch statement is currently very limited in its current form, it can only take numbers, strings or enums. So if we would extend that, and that's exactly what the Java language designers did, we could maybe also support pattern matching in switch statements and expressions. So let's try to rewrite this logic as a switch expression in this case. Switch expressions be became available in Java 14. And uh, so in the previous example, we had an else block write. Down at the bottom, an else block for all other cases, for all unknown effect implementations. In this case, we will replace it with the default branch, right? And let's slowly introduce branches for each effect implementation. So the delay and the reverb, overdrive, tremolo tuner. And also we can have an effect loop, of course, which is also an implementer of the effect interface. In this case, we have to do a little trick to do a recursive call to make sure that everything, um, or actually it's not recursion, um, an iterative call to make sure that for every containing effect the apply method is called again. And there we have it. We have reduced it just to 11 lines of code. This is much better. Really improves also uh, improves the situation for everyone reading the code because your attention is drawn immediately to these to these seven or um, yeah to the seven cases and you don't have to be bothered by the ceremony anymore okay so maybe the question arises why didn't we just um, implement the apply method right here and implement it in all the impl implementing classes right and provide a different implementation well, of course we could have done that um, but we wanted to show you better matching that's the first reason not, not a very good one I guess um, but on top of that, not every operation that you want to apply to all effects have a meaning for all effect implementers. I'll give you some examples. So the apply method is a good example because you can apply every effect implementer. That's not a problem. And you can set up all these effect pedals probably have volume, uh, volume knobs, right? So set volume would also be a, a good one. Contains, I'm not really sure about contains, um, but you can actually put that in the effect loop class. But there are also a lot of operations that don't really belong in the effect interface. The fact that a tuner is active, for example. The effect interface, sorry, the effect interface doesn't know anything about that, only the tuner pedal knows about that. Uh, what if you want to compare the delay time to the reverb room size? I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but if you would, you wouldn't want to put this in the effect interface because you can't even implement it in the other implementations. Or if your current tone is suitable to play the song Pride in the Name of Love by U2. Uh, I don't have any clue how to implement that, by the way, but you can't pollute your API, your effect interface API, with all these operations. You shouldn't, actually. So this method would make a lot more sense if you would make it static, like this. Then you could just create a class with a few static operations and just call them as you go. You wouldn't need to rely on any inheritance or implementing or those kinds of uh, mechanisms. And it would be a pure function, actually. So I really like that. So before pattern matching, I think we would have solved this by using a visitor pattern, right? And to make sure that only certain implementations get an implementation and, and, and the rest doesn't. Well, with pattern matching, you don't need a visitor pattern anymore or a common supertype. And you can have a single expression instead of many assignments, like we already seen before. It's less error-prone in adding cases, because a case is only a single line, so you can't forget anything. It's obviously more concise. We have reduced the 25-line code example to seven. And it's safer, because the compiler can check for missing cases. I think Peter will come back to this when he talks about sealed classes, sealed types. So, question, what if effects is null? Traditionally, switch statements and expressions throw null pointer exceptions if the selector expression evaluates to null. So if you wanted to prevent this, you had maybe, test, maybe had to test for null outside of the switch expression. So 
maybe on top the first line of the method, if effect is null, write some, return some null describing description or something. But that is also ceremony. It's an edge case, and you want your attention to be drawn to the actual logic. So, as a part of pattern matching for switch, it's also possible to define a case null and make sure that you can handle the null case in an additional uh, switch uh, or case label, actually. But if you forget to uh, address the case null, it will just behave like before, backwards compatible again. We like that about Java, don't we? Um, so it will still throw a null pointer exception. But if you do case null, it will execute um, the branch that you have defined right there. And as you can see, you can also comma separate them and combine them with the default branch, for example, like we've shown you here. So another quick demo to show you guarded patterns. A guarded pattern is actually a combination of a pattern and a Boolean expression. And if you want the pattern to match, the Boolean expression on the right-hand side must additionally be true in order for the guarded pattern uh, to match. I'll uh, give you an example of this. So back into the IDE, and um, I'm going to open up a class that has our switch case expression. Um, I think it's called effect applier, there we go. So I have copied the same switch expression that we had on the slides right here. Well, it's, it's a tiny bit different, but um, not that, di that much different. I want to concentrate on the case tuner right here. I'm not sure, are there people here who play electric guitar in the audience? Yeah. So you know, if you use a tuner pedal, it mutes your entire signal, right? Because you're tuning. Uh, so what's, what's the point actually of, um, uh, you know, of, of doing a tuner pedal when your guitar is already in tune? I only want to tune when the guitar is not in tune, right? So we can, um, we can optimize for this case. So I only want to activate the tuner um, if the guitar is currently out of tune. Now, uh, how do I do that? I just copy the case and um, um, if, the tuner, if the guitar is out of tune, I can just ask the guitar, are you in tune? I have to negate this expression, of course. Then say tuner active, and if, it's, uh, if there's a tuner but the guitar is in tune, we don't have to do anything. So we can just, I don't know, oh, sorry, uh, empty string or something. We don't need the string format anyway, right here. Now it gives us an interesting message. Probably says something about dominance. Yeah, so the label is dominated by a preceding case label tuner. Well, if you're reading the JEPs, there's an entire chapter about dominance. So um, in this case, if there is a tuner, it will always get to this branch. doesn't matter what tuner. So it won't, won't ever execute this one. Um, but you can, um, you can um, modify this by changing the order. So if you do it like this, move, move the, the case one up, it will first check for tuners and if the guitar is not in tune. And if the guitar is in tune, it will get to this one and nothing will happen. So this is a guarded pattern. I think introduced in Java 17, also still active in Java 18, in a, in a preview status. And you can make sure that, um, well, you actually you can optimize your pattern match with an additional Boolean expression. Back to the slides again. So, um, so this is actually the example that I showed you already. That gains, it gains a guarded pattern. Um, so one of the main reasons for Java to start supporting this, guarding, guarded patterns, <coughs> is to prevent further testing in a case block. Because if we wouldn't have guarded patterns, we, we would need, um, I don't have the slide right now, but imagine, <laughs> imagine if you don't have guarded patterns, you would just have pattern match, and then you would have to create a very, quite a large uh, case block where you would again do an if-else or something. So the point is that uh, the logic will, uh, it's a very elegant way to read the logic. And if you would need to nest if else uh, expressions again, then the elegance will be gone and there's still more ceremony. Um, I talked to Peter last week and we were laughing about the fact that we did this talk a few times already, but we have never uh, actually presented the same slide deck. Each time we have to um, change some things. And that is because 
um, pattern matching is still very much in development. And for Java 19, actually, a different mechanism to replace guarded patterns is being proposed. So we changed the slides again. So what, what I showed you now with guarded patterns, which works with Java 18, will probably be replaced by something called when clauses in Java 19. Hot of the press, we just read about this last week. Um, when clauses work the same, kind of the same as guarded patterns. So in the previous slide you saw, um, oh, sorry. In the previous slide you saw that it was uh, the double end operator. In Java 19, it will be replaced by the, the when, the when keyword right here. And um, uh, the reason they did this is because, um, well, you know about the, you know about the, um, the, new, the new way that Java is introducing new features by, by saying that it's a preview feature, right? And they are gathering uh, feedback from developers, how they like uh, the addition. And the feedback that they got was that guarded patterns look a lot like Boolean expressions. And um, in the future, there are plans to um, also support uh, Boolean patterns. So in that case, you could get case false arrow, do something with false. Case true, arrow, do something with false. What happens if you would have case false and the guarded pattern and this expression also uh, evaluates to a Boolean? You don't know for sure what is part of, of the pattern and what will be part of the guarded pattern. So uh, lots of ambigu ambiguity there, and um, that's why they chose to replace it with the when clause for now. So you don't have that Boolean stuff going on. And this is a slide that I, I lost for a bit, uh, a few minutes back. This is what you would have to do if we wouldn't have guarded patterns or starting from Java 19 when clauses for an additional Boolean expression. So we've seen that guarded patterns were proposed, but actually they are replaced by when clauses. So it's not really a kind of pattern, but you, you do use them in conjunction with switch case. And um, Pattern matching for switch, this entire feature was in preview in Java 17, second preview in Java 18. And because of the addition of where clause, um, sorry, when clauses, it is actually in a third preview state in Java 19. So still not final, still gathering some um, feedback from developers to see how this, is, uh, how, how this is received. So we'll try to keep an eye on it. And if you are interested, you can do the same. OK, so Peter is uh, here. And he wants to talk about deconstruction patterns. So, Peter, yes. enlighten us. Thank you. So I've never seen anything that is in the third preview. So this is the first time. Um, so now we're going to head into some really interesting stuff. Because this stuff isn't in Java yet. You're going to see it in the, f in, in the next features. And therefore, we have to add this disclaimer. Because um, we can't tell you if the following features are coming to Java and syntax and implementation may still change. This has, that's the disclaimer we have to give uh, before heading to the interesting stuff. So if we head back to the, um, to the demo that Hanno in, um, presented, we see the same switch expression. And if you want to introduce a deconstruction pattern, it looks like this. It's something familiar, right? It's, it looks a bit like a constructor. And it, maybe if you're from JavaScript or another language that, that supports deconstruction, then you're familiar to the syntax. And what's going on here is that we want to match for an overdrive, overdrive object and want to deconstruct it once it matched. And then we can directly use this variable. So we gained access to this variable and don't have to um, access, access it via an, uh, a getter. So that's very interesting. And that makes us wonder what do we need to add to support such a deconstruction pattern. So this is the overdrive class right now. So it's just a simple object. And if we want to support deconstruction patterns, you might need something like a pattern definition. And it looks a bit like the reverse of constructor. Um, we bind the variable, uh, the, the input parameter, to the value of the field, as you can see here. So it's like the instead of 
constructing an object, we are deconstructing an object. So, very cool. Um, if we want to add, if we add pattern definitions for all these objects, then it looks like this. So, we're a bit too lazy to fix the alignment, but, but uh, bear with me. And if you look at this switch expression, the benefits are increasing. Because if you look closely to the reverb pattern match, we directly gained access to both variables. So we don't have to call the getters twice, we just have access to the variables. And it's a bit like going to the supermarket. If you want to buy two products, you don't go into the supermarket, buy one, and head out and go back into the supermarket and buy another. You just head into the supermarket, buy two products, and then head out. So it's it's very it's it 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 fits more uh, it fits more our purpose. So we can also compose pattern, and then it's where it becomes very powerful. But because if you want to define such a method, is delay time equal to the reverb room size? As Hanno mentioned, it creates the crazy method. But if you want to support such a method, then you can implement it with pattern matching. So here you see a lot of pattern, patterns we already presented. We see the instance of check. We check if the effect loop is instance of an effect loop. And if the effect loop can be deconstructed as a delay and a re reverb object. And if that's the case, we directly gain access to the variables. So then it's very convenient to do the equality test, time in millisecond and room size. So that's very convenient. So this is, this is actually the one, uh, if you would uh, like to use streams, then you could do the same thing and it covers a lot of more lines. And the imperative approach didn't even make the slide, so go figure. So very powerful stuff. And that's another pattern we discovered, a deconstruction pattern. So maybe you use VAR. If you, if you are on Java 11, you can use the VAR, uh, uh, VAR keyword. And we use it when it's obvious which type of uh, object you're dealing with. So in this case, it's a Telecaster guitar. And we know that's a guitar. And we leave out the guitar. And in the future, we can use this VAR pattern in our patterns. So if you look closely to our example, maybe we don't care about these, these uh, variables. So we can introduce a VAR pattern. So the same with the other VAR, the use of VAR, the compiler infers the needed types. And, and we can use that in our VAR patterns and in our pattern matching. Cool. So if you look closely to room size, our name, we don't use name at all. Look. So why do we actually write it down there? So there's where any patterns come in. And every time we think about any patterns, we think of, you think of Homer was trying to find the any key. Um, and what we can do is actually use an underscore for that. So we, it's all about making the code more readable. It doesn't pollute the code base with variables we aren't going to need in the equality test. And it's the difference between the VAR pattern is that it doesn't bind any value to a variable. Cool. So another use case for pattern matching is some optimization. Because you can imagine the effect loop is quite a heavy computational method. It goes through all the objects and applies all these uh, methods. And if, it's, if the effect loop contains a lot of objects, it, it's some heavy computational to do. So if we want to avoid that, then it would be an optimization. So if we look closely to the effect loop, uh, and we can introduce an optimization. Because when there is an active tuner, all the other effects can be muted. So can we define a pattern that matches for an effect loop which consists of an 
tuner, and in that case, just return something very simple. So that's the case here. Um, we match for an effect loop which consists of a tuner and something else. And if that's the case, we avoid the execution of this, this method or this stream and just return a string format. So, very cool. Again. So, the benefits are better encapsulation. You only see the, uh, the variables that you're going to use, more elegant logic, and we can do some optimization. So, another kind of pattern, a var pattern and an any pattern. And these patterns are written out in documents. Um, we treat out the slides afterwards so you can uh, get to the link. And some very interesting documents um, to read if you're into um, patterns, pattern matching. So in the next, in the next slides, we're going to show you that pattern matching will play very nice with sealed types and records. Um, because if you remember sealed classes, and we're going to show you actually, Mirror. So, if we make effect a sealed interface, so this is the effect interface, it's very simple. And if you are familiar with sealed interfaces, you know you can make this sealed, which tells the compiler, hey, this is the effect interface and it only permits these implementations. And the benefit is that the effect applier knows which if if the, if it if there are all cases if all cases of effect or implementation of effect are covered, we might not need the default branch anymore. So we have this, and we might delete it. So IntelliJ tells us, hey, the switch expression does not cover all input values. So we need to insert either the default branch, or we create the missing branch. So we. If we add it, so octave, octave effect at play. So, and it doesn't complain anymore because the compiler knows we covered all the branches. So, that's very cool. Yep. So we made effect a sealed type. Um, and you see it here. So we don't need to use the default branch anymore. Cool. So you may be familiar to records. Uh, a record uh, gives you all the implementations of these methods. And we reckon it will be the first, first installment of deconstruction pattern because it's very uh, logical to add an implementation for a default pattern. Cool. Some other pattern. So an array pattern. Maybe you want to match for an array or the content of an array. You can do that with array patterns. So imagine you have an, an effect loop which consists of these um, variables, and we want to match for the effects, the third, uh, the third, uh, the third uh, input parameter. And if you see the first case. And then uh, we match for an effect loop which consists, uh, which doesn't consist of any effect. But if you want to match for an effect, we can define it as follows. We just define a single variable. So the effect loop consists only of a single effect. And you can take it further. You can use the spread operator to match for even more, one or more, two and two or more. You get the feeling. Cool. So. Another kind of pattern. So can we use it? Well, seal types, you can use it. You maybe already use it in, in production. I use it in production. It's final. Um, the uh, record patterns are in the third preview, as already mentioned. And uh, record patterns, uh, this is actually the completeness is in third preview, and record patterns are still in preview. So very cool new patterns. So Hanna is going to tell you something about better serialization. So, Hanno, it's up to you. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. So it's kind of a pity that we can't use them right away, right? But it's great to see where Java is headed, that all these things will become available to us 
at some point in the future. I really hope it will be soon. And the same holds true for a better serialization. I really have to give you a, a big disclaimer. I call it a disclaimer plus plus, or maybe even here be dragons, but we can't be sure at all that the following features will appear in Java as depicted. But these are just how things currently stand. So we read the documents that are about researching a better serialization in the future. Um, this is how things stand right now, but they can change a lot in the meantime. I, sh I surely hope not, but they can. So you've been warned. Um, we have seen that constructors and deconstruction patterns kind of act as oppos opposites, because a constructor, as you all know, transforms a set of typed fields into a populated object, whereas a deconstruction pattern takes a populated object and transforms it into a set of typed fields and makes it available through flow scoping. This is an important observation when you're thinking about serialization. Just to refresh your memory, serialization is a very important feature in Java, although not everyone likes it, and, and certainly not its current implementation, but it really helped Java gain a lot of popularity in the late 90s due to its application in RMI, remote method invocation. Uh, but many people really hate its current implementation. I heard a quote from Java architect Brian Gutz, who said, Ethan Gollum from Lord of the Rings hates serialization. So really everyone hates it. Um, why do we hate it? Because firstly, it undermines the accessibility model because fields are populated through reflection magic, right? So if a field is private, it gets populated anyway. Um, serialization logic is not readable code. You can't just read the code that serializes it. Well, you can if you override the, the specific methods that you need to remember what names they are. Uh, I don't really like it. Um, it also bypasses constructors. So if you would apply data validation in your constructors, it bypasses the constructor. So any data validation is not executed at all. But using patterns could maybe improve the situation in the future. So imagine that we want to serialize an effect loop. Uh, the familiar construct to us, the grouping of, uh, of, uh, of effects. Well, um, we start by well, we start by having a constructor, of course, and then we uh, we add um, a pattern definition. And we can use the pattern definition to serialize our object. Now let's assume that the serialized representation of our effect loop is a string, the name, and it doesn't work, a string, the name, and an array of effects, right? Um, and we can convert that into uh, a populated object right here, or just the other way around, sorry. We, um, we use this to serialize. Um, and in this case, we add a factory method to deserialize our object. We could also have used an overloaded constructor. It doesn't really matter. In this case, it converts a string and an effect array back to an effect loop object, a populated object. And if the constructor had any validation, we would call it here. Actually, we're using the constructor. Yeah, this name, line 11. And to make the intent of the code a bit more clear, we, we, we could use annotations. Annotate the methods that say this factory method is the deserializer, this deserializes the object, and this, uh, this pattern definition is the serializer, this serializes the object. And if this would become a reality, we really improve on the drawbacks of serialization and many of the reasons why people hate it. Because the accessibility model is no longer undermined because the private variables still remain private. Serialization logic has become readable code. So you can just review the code. You can, you can um, push it through SonarCube, for example, for static code analysis. And it no longer bypasses constructor and data validation. So we've really improved on that. Of course, some challenges remain, which is why it's still being researched. For example, how do you support multiple versions of one class? One of the ideas is to um, improve the serializer and deserializer annotations with a property version so that you could have multiple methods that are annotated with serializer, but provide a specific version so that you can annotate the method to handle a specific version of the class. These are ideas. And if you really like them and want to learn more about them, there's a document written by Brian Goetz um, as part of Project Ember, which is called Towards Better Serialization. You can read it if you follow that link. Um, the feature is, of course, very much in the future, but if you want to follow it, you can read up on it. And we think there are even more expansions in the future. I'll quickly go over them, um, some of the ideas. Here be dragons again. Pattern bind statements, which means you can use a pattern outside of an if uh, statement or a switch statement. You can just use, for uh, they are trying to uh, call it the keyword let, 
but I've um, adopted the double underscore syntax here to uh, to let you know uh, that it's a temporary keyword, so they're not sure how they are going to call the keyword. But this is a convention that the Java language designers all, always use in their documents. But imagine this let keyword is present, you can say let reverb string name in room size is reverb, and then if the pattern matches, you can do something with name and room size in the next line of code. And of course, if the pattern doesn't match, you can also provide an else clause and throw, for example, an illegal argument exception. There are a few other ideas uh, to build on the current pattern matching ideas. Um, and patterns, for example, to combine two patterns in order to match, they both must match. Um, patterns in catch clauses, this would be, I think, a nice addition to the current multi-catch block that we got in Java 7 with uh, the pipe operator. And maybe also collection patterns. I think they will build on the ideas that Peter showed us with array patterns. But the details are getting murkier by the minute because they are very new ideas. They are likely to change and probably they will be spread out in the next versions of Java. To summarize, we've already listed the many pattern kinds, but there are also three pattern contexts in which you can use patterns. Um, to start off the instance of predicate, there you can use patterns right now, type patterns, for example. Uh, in a sp switch statement or expression, also type patterns for now. And maybe in the future, uh, pattern binding statements, which are currently called let. It's time to wrap things up, I guess. Um, we think pattern matching is a rich feature arc that will play out over several versions of Java. Uh, the first installment allows us to use type patterns in instance of, and as we have seen, this reduces ceremony of such code. And the second installment brought us patterns in switch. We think future installments will probably bring deconstruction patterns, firstly on records and afterwards on more constructs, with the aim of making destructuring objects as easy as constructing them and also more similar to constructing them. We think together with the related features of records and sealed classes, pattern matching holds the potential to streamline and simplify much of the code we write today. And to get back to the question we asked at the start, we think we have to conclude that pattern matching is a major feature and a very interesting way uh, in which our favorite language is developing right now. And we really want to keep track of it and make sure that we know where it's headed. So that is all for now, all we wanted to tell you. Um, the code is on this, behind this GitHub link. We will tweet uh, the slide deck later. So follow us if you want to, uh, to view them. And we have a few minutes left if there are any questions from the room. So if you want to ask us anything, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, yes, I have a question about the guarded, if st uh, guarded switch statements. Yeah. Um, when I saw that, I was like, they can't be serious about turning when into a keyword that would like break so much, including the entire Mojito library. Um, uh -huh. Why not just use if, because that's already a, a keyword. But the good thing about the permits keyword is that there's a synonym allows that libraries can still use, even if permits is a keyword, you just use allows. but if and when are synonymous, you can't turn them both into a keyword. I mean, you can, but I don't think they should. I don't think it's going to fly. Yeah. So your question is, why do you use the when? Yeah. I mean, they, they, they ha they'll have to turn when into a keyword, as I understand. That, yeah. that, that's yeah. just not going to happen, I think. But does, yeah. So, sorry. I think it's a valid question. We were, to be honest, also a little surprised. They didn't stick with guarded patterns, actually. <laughs> um, so are you sure Mokito actually uses the when as a keyword? I mean, it's no, not as a, a method keyword. name, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that won't compile anymore if when is a keyword. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see your point. Um, yeah, um, we didn't read anything about it. Um, so, and, and we're also not sure that they are sticking with this, of course, because they're gathering feedback based on Java 19, which will be released in September. So um, this is how things currently stand. I'm, I'm really curious to see how this will develop and whether Makito has to change everything or not. <laughs> so so yeah, we can't really give you a definitive answer, right? No, so if you have, so, so they got a, get a feedback. So if, you, if you're on the mailing list, you, which you can find following the links, the, then we can uh, give those feedback and it's That's valid feedback, so. Actually a good point to give this as feedback to them. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Maybe you, you will, <laughs> <laughs> or we. <laughs> Yeah, 
More questions? Yeah. Yeah, please. I, mean, I was just going to say one thing that like Kotlin uses when as a keyword already and Makito's already like solved this oh. in Kotlin. <laughs> so you just add like a single parenthesis in front of the, or a single quote in front, in front of the when in Kotlin and then it allows you to use it. So it's already kind of been done. Oh, okay. Great. That's a great addition. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, so basically I was wondering if uh, Java Stream API uh, supports uh, instance of pattern matching. So what do I mean by that is when you filter uh, for instances of a specific uh, class, um, do you then need to still map it to that, uh, that instance later? Or does it already um, in the next line know that it's that instance? Great question. Because I, 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 I would guess that that would be a pretty common use case. Great question. Yes, as we have seen in the context, it's not up there. So we haven't seen it having been used in the streaming stream API. So I really don't know. So it's, well, it's getting murky. I don't know. Murky, by the second. I'm trying to understand your question. So what if you would do a dot filter um, product instance of guitar, right? And yes. then do a map operation after that? As things stand right now, you're already sure that it's a guitar at that point, right? Right. Without even uh, using a type pattern. Uh, but if you want to, for example, access some uh, methods that are on that specific type later, uh, the stream API would still be on that uh, less specific type, unless you map it ah. and, and cast to it, right? Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh, okay. Well, that's a great question. I I would like to know the answer myself right now. So. I mean, I uh, <laughs> there there's a hack for it, so you could use yeah. flat map, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's sure. kind of a hack. Well, thanks for the question. We'll look into that. Yeah, yeah no problem. I see Thank times you. up, but if there are any more questions, come see us before you exit the room. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks. Thank you.